Uh, good evening, everyone. So glad to be back on Endo Crusaders Group with a session on endometriosis. I'm Dr. Shilpa, your host. Dr. Vimi is with me again, uh, our, our specialist. And we have Julie with us today as a guest. So what are we going to talk about today? The biggest transition in a woman's life. What? Menopause. Yes. So menopause occurs when you actually stop menstruating. All right. So when you go without a period, of, uh, without a period for 12 months in a row, that's when you are having a menopause. And the time after that is post-menopause. On an average, people go through menopause at an age of 51. But many like me and Julie are suddenly pushed into surgical menopause. And that's when the chaos begins. So I'm so happy to have Julie with us today. And Julie is a 38-year-old mom of five-year-old twins who actually found herself into a surgical menopause after an extremely long battle with endometriosis. Professionally, she's an AVP in a consulting firm and she is the founder of Live Fearless. That is a passion project she began post her surgery to create conversations and educate women on nuances of menopause and help them lead a healthy life. Live Fearless aims to push women to continue living their second innings of life as passionately and successfully as a younger age. Dr. Vimi is going to discuss endometriosis with us and how endometriosis and menopause are interconnected. So hi Vimi and hi Julie. Hi Dr. Shilpa. Hi Shilpa, hi Julie. Hi. Yeah. So I'm Dr. Shilpa, I'm your smile creator and I am the endo warrior as Julie is. <laughs> right Julie? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so Julie, um, to begin with, I'm sure initially you would have been like a regular woman going to the office, doing your work and, you know, the routine. Tell us a little about your story. How did you, how, how does your story go? So, um, yeah, um, my endometriosis was actually detected when I was 27. And um, for actually, uh, you know, 10 years, endo didn't recover for me, thankfully. Though, though I uh, did undergo uh, surgery for fibroids and uh, you know the likes but endo had not recurred and I think pandemic just affected all of us so badly that uh, just post pandemic uh, you know I started having insane amount of uh, pain uh, I used to uh, literally uh, bleed 30 days of uh, the month I was literally constantly bleeding I mean it, it just wouldn't stop and the pain wouldn't go it just went to another level so when I got my test done we realized that it was stage four for endo uh, you know there were additions on the tubes uh, in the ovaries on the uterus it was really bad so I was put on lupride and lupride backfired I started I got severe urticaria with it my periods didn't stop so we didn't want to do, uh, we didn't want to go ahead with the hysterectomy because uh, obviously, you know, at 37, that's not uh, what you want to do. It was going to put me into a surgical menopause. So we were just trying how we could postpone it a little more to at least, you know, till I completed 40, but it didn't really happen, uh, you know, because uh, periods never stopped in spite of all this. And then we decided, okay, we will go ahead and, uh, you know, do the hysterectomy. Uh, the idea was to save the ovaries, but it was really bad. I mean, and then while, uh, while the surgery, uh, during the surgery, adenomyosis was detected. So all in all, uh, you know, a uh, very terrifying experience. And I didn't have a choice then to land into, uh, you know, surgical menopause at 37. I when it know. happened, uh, it was very scary at the start because, um, I didn't know what to expect and honestly, um, you don't know whom to ask, uh, you know, the only thing that you can do is Google. I did ask my doctor, uh, my doctor was very supportive, but how bad a surgical menopause would be was something that prepared you know, I could never get a, a, a grip on. Yeah, and I could not prepare for and uh, just when I got out of it, uh, the starting was, um, was scary. Um, mood swings I used to my body was recovering from uh, a major surgery and mentally I was really down 
and the fact that i had kids at home uh, you know whom i had to uh, take care of to uh, family was there but you know ultimately it's your responsibility and then work was quite uh, you know demanding so it was not that the best when it started and uh, eventually uh, i started researching a lot more uh, being from professionally from a healthcare background i started researching 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 and i realized that nobody really talks about menopause and i have no clue why i mean every single women you know 3.9 billion women are going to go through it in their lives and we don't even discuss about it correct so i just thought that you know if i'm going to be researching about it anyways why not just you know create awareness why not put that information out there so that you know even if it helps two women i would be correct. so happy you know because i think and uh, over the last one year uh, with all the conversations that i've been having with women a uh, lot of women don't even know what their experience is menopause uh, sure. Sure. you know sure. or the perimenopause the you know perimenopause. leading to menopause the the previous whatever eight nine years when the whole struggle begins and that's where the fearless was born um, and uh, you know that's when the whole initiative of trying to uh, educate and you know uh, put forth my experiences on how i'm dealing with it and how you know what am i finding good to work around with and deal with that's that's basically how life fearless originated but then that's so that's so lovely that you started something like that i mean there are a lot of women who follow you i've been seeing your insta posts and they're truly awesome so what are the challenges that you faced uh, when you got into menopause uh you know dr shilpa the biggest challenge for me was to accept that my body is not um, feeling the same anymore and maybe the intensity was a lot more because of it being a surgical menopause so suddenly you are pushed into that but um, i started uh, you know i started feeling not so great about myself at the start because mentally i was uh, not there you know i would find it difficult to focus i would be exhausted tremendously exhausted uh, to some extent insomnia was creeping in and i was not able to sleep at night um, i didn't have thankfully i didn't have that bad of uh, hot flashes that a lot of women talk about but uh, i did start experiencing uh, pain in my body which was never there in the past Correct. so um, that the acceptance of the fact that my body is not um, going to feel the same i put on weight uh, i was always a very physically active person so uh, i was always very careful about the weight i uh, you know i would put on and uh, just post surgery i did not put a lot of weight on but i did put on 5 6 kgs which are are very difficult for me to shed so the whole transition is very difficult to accept you know that your body is changing mentally you're not there your level of patience is falling so yeah it was challenging till uh, till the time that i realized that you know making few changes in my lifestyle really give me a great uh, deal of you know it really improves a great deal of these symptoms and help to deal with them better so yeah at the start wasn't the best mm-hmm. but eventually i think um, every woman just uh, figures the ways around it yes yes i still sometimes uh, struggle to accept that you know i'm not feeling the way i would before but if i had to actually compare the endo pain versus this i think this is slightly better <laughs> <laughs> so uh we me uh this is what a woman goes through so for people for general people i would want you to tell what exactly is menopause scientifically what what happens in the body yeah as uh, shilpa you already told that when the periods do not come for a complete one year by definition that is called as menopause and mm-hmm. this is a transition from the uh, middle age to menopausal age which is preceded by a phase called as perimenopausal phase so when it happens naturally there is a uh, there is not a sudden decline of hormones but there is a transition in the hormone hormones and slowly they decline and the estrogen level starts falling fsh level start increasing and the women starts entering the menopause and they may present with certain symptoms and once they stop periods for complete one year 12 months 
it's not three months it's not six months it's a complete cessation of periods for 12 months we die we diagnose them at that they have reached the menopause stage now it can be sometimes premature menopause which happens before the age of 40 years there are several reasons for it most common reason are genetic and premature ovarian failure and the second most common is drug induced mm. which is very common in endometriosis, endometriosis. so it can be medically induced or it can be surgical menopause so uh, biochemically speaking the fsh will be high and the estrogen levels are low so peripheral estrogen comes down and it results in all the symptoms of menopause uh, stage so it is very important that you understand that in perimenopausal phase you may have irregular periods some women may have delayed cycles some women may have early periods or short cycles but most of the women go through that phase and then uh, they start skipping their periods for 3 months 6 months and finally for a year that is when they reach menopause so usual age of menopause in indian population is 45 to 55 years and on an average it is 51 to 52 years as you already mentioned true and uh, what complaints do women come to you with when they have menopause or perimenopause what complaints do women come with first complaint is most common is the irregular period and absence of period for 12 months mm-hmm. or more second day is uh, hot flashes is the most common symptom as julie said she never had it that's a very good thing <laughs> that way it's exactly troubles them so much that most of the time they come to us and they tell us that the ac is it's on terrible. and they feel hot it's terrible i ask me <laughs> all of us sudden you'll get up and you uh, just feel right. so hot and suddenly you will get drenched yeah fatigue is one of the common symptoms mood changes irritability bone pains the body aches decrease in libido many patients come to us and they complain that they don't have any desire for sex but uh, the partner pressurizes them to have sex so this is one of the very common complaints which patient tell us because they feel helpless at that time uh, vaginal dryness recurrent urinary tract infection uh, uh, lo- because of loss of lubrication and uh, loss of estrogen levels the skin becomes uh, very fragile and uh, any uh, little trauma also can cause uh, vaginal infections so these are the most common symptoms with which patients come to us and uh, the most com- commonest one is the hot flushes all right so um julie what changes i i mean obviously dr vimi has told us what patients come with but as a person who has gone undergone menopause what were you feeling i mean what changes are uh, you could see in yourself mentally physically emotionally gen i mean overall so um physically like i mentioned you know the weight gain i mean um it's something which i think just happens it's um uh, as a part of your body transition you know probably your metabolism is slowing down estrogen levels are low so that also is impacted uh i've also seen a lot of hair fall happening i've seen the texture of my hair changing from uh, the way it was previously true, uh, true. very clearly uh i tend to get rashes very soon uh, now a lot more than it was previously vaginal dryness has been a uh, a big uh issue uh, issue that i have uh, faced uh, low libido is also another one uh, where i do i do see a change in me from previous to now um and joint ache you know um you know all the aches which i probably must have hurt myself pehle hmm. uh, i can actually feel them now you know if i must have hurt my knee matlab my knee would have been a little weaker initially Mm. that pain i i have started feeling now which i wasn't feeling for Along the longest time. time so physically i've seen that uh, change uh, you know happening in me mentally if you ask me it's sometimes it becomes very difficult to concentrate on something to to steadily sit there and focus um, doesn't happen uh, i think my memory is also not at its best maybe it's i'm still adapting to it but it's not it's not as sharp as i would i'm sure my husband will be happy about it uh, but <laughs> it's not you know i'm not just about there so um and uh, i tend i i see myself getting more anxious on things that i used to not uh, 
previously Although, oh, yeah. emotionally i tend to get very snappy at times i tend to get very uh, irritable at times so yeah i mean you do see those uh, changes you know like there are times when i i just don't want to talk to anybody which uh, which was never a case with me as very social person so i can see that you know it does impact on a lot of levels and honestly i want to tell you this that um, most of my um, emotional or physical changes have are a lot aggravated when i'm stressed Correct. so i have realized if i deal with the stress bit of it you know in certain times uh, the rest of it sort of come under a little more control so i don't know what's the connection i'm sure there's a connection i'm still trying to figure out but when i'm stressed like if i have a very overwhelming day and i have too many things to remember and too many things to do i'm just so jumbled in my head that i can't think straight but okay. if i put that stress down you know i maintain a notebook i write down everything so mm. that my mental space is not occupied with too many things when i can't deal with it so the minute i write it down and i remove that stress from my head and put it on the book i suddenly realize that my mood's getting better everything is working perfectly mm. fine you know so it's it's like a domino effect you know it just works it does it does so um yeah those are the changes that i've seen and um and that's that some of some of the things that you know i am figuring to work around like if i ex- exercise the days i exercise you know i work out trust me a half an hour walk also does miracles to me so for me i think uh, this is a uh, last i mean i've been telling this to my family you know fine i used to exercise but obviously i was not extremely regular when it used to come to exercise but now it's more of a necessity yes than anything Absolutely. else because i know if i exercise i'm going to feel better and my yes. day is going to be better you know yes plus second thing as you said the joint pains and the bone pains and the knee pains right now i'm going through physiotherapy and if somebody asked me what physiotherapy i was like i'm overall like you know <laughs> so every- <laughs> so, like the car has to go for overhauling yes. after a couple of years now that's what is happening and In, i i think that's how it is insomnia yes. has been on its high because of the menopause so you just have to see what you'll have to do and, yeah what works but honestly honestly dr shilpa i have realized that even minor changes in your lifestyle very minor ones you know the amount of impact they have on you are incredible like at one point in time like i said you know i started having knee pain and i was so stressed i said oh my god uh, don't tell me you know i'm already feeling like a 50 year old and my knee will start hurting and my back will start hurting i was so stressed i didn't know what to do with my uh, you know uh, thing i probably have uh, gone to an orthopedic i have troubled my gynec i'm like what do i do with this and i was reading through something and um, uh, i read uh, this and i started exercising my quadriceps correct you know to take the pressure off my knee and trust me it works it works it worked it worked great you know so the, like i said you know a lot of small changes i mean if you consciously uh, you know incorporate them in your life they really make a great deal of uh, difference to what your day to day is absolutely i completely agree so we may Uh, when a woman is going through menopause what tests are there any tests which a woman should go through and second thing second question i want to ask you about this is hrt there are a lot of misconceptions about hrt so i want to talk a little about hrt so does hrt help women cope up with the menopausal symptoms what are the pros what are the cons because it is so confusing you know there are so many things online which are given there are gynecs who talk you know some people are like pro hrt some people are like anti hrt so what's it all about so uh, if you ask me test basically if you want to diagnose menopause two tests only one is fsh and one is serum estradiol <clears throat> fsh will be high serum estradiol will be low mostly in menopause mm. uh, but at that age when you have reached menopause usually routine tests should also be done Uh, mm-hmm. we should also check their calcium levels vitamin d levels the lipid profile their heart status the bone density is very important correct so they are they do develop osteopenia and osteoporosis and they are prone to fractures True. so these should be kept in mind and uh, these tests should also be done as a routine and other tests often should uh, the tests be as done. a part of uh, women health package they can take other once tests depending on their history and all around once in a year these tests needs to be done 
Yes, annual checkup. Annual checkup. Okay. Most common are these lipid profile, heart. Mm. Mm. They can do ECG, and uh, if a physician or cardiologist recommends a uh, echo, then yes. If they are above fifty years, we do recommend echo. But mm. if younger population, then depending on the physician or cardiologist advice. Okay. But yes, calcium and vitamin D levels are equally important, along with their routine checkup like thyroid, blood sugars, and mammogram, depending on their breast cancer or ovarian cancer history, and mm. a routine ultrasound. All right. Now you asked about the HRT. It depends on the patient symptoms and patient's age as well. Now, suppose a patient has a premature menopause, we prefer to give a hormone replacement therapy till the age of menopause, which is considered to be forty-five or fifty years of age. Okay. Because they do not have any estrogen, they have low levels of estrogen. Their uh, bone loss will be very high because estrogen is very very important for uh, calcium deposition uh, in bones as well. so osteopenia and osteoporosis chances will be very high a girl who has already reached a menopause at the age of 35 or 40 years so we tend to give them some kind of hormone replacement therapy uh, mm -hmm. till the age of expected age of menopause if okay. not till the age of menopause at least till 40 42 years okay now at the usual age of menopause if somebody has entered a menopause and they are completely asymptomatic they do not need any therapy and patients who are symptomatic at any age they definitely need some kind of hormone replacement therapy now it is available in various forms in terms of uh, oral supplements uh, patches are there injectables are also there but usually uh, estrogen therapy is used some patients we cannot use estrogen therapy because the use is contraindicated because of breast cancer history or you may say endometriosis patients do not want to take estrogen supplements although this kind of estrogen you take oral contraceptive pills also this does not aggravate endometriosis but patients also uh, do not want to take then we give them some other drugs or other group of drugs so hormone replacement therapy is indicative wherever symptoms are there so patients do those who have hot flashes and severe symptoms irritability uh, mood changes definitely they need some kind of treatment vaginal dryness recurrent utis vaginal estrogen creams work wonders okay so there is no need to uh, hide it or uh, they should tell these symptoms that they have issue because sexual sexual intercourse also becomes painful for them because of dryness so estrogen creams uh, give uh, the increase the vascularity in the skin and mm. it gives a very uh, supple and vascularized skin and their uh, pain comes down vaginal dryness comes down so uh, it all depends on the patient's symptoms age and what they are looking for so we decide the hormone replacement therapy for them this is nothing uh, there is no hoax around it and we should not get scared of hormone replacement therapy because there were certain studies where uh, breast cancer was related to hormone replacement right. therapy and other side effects were there but it all depends on the patient's age and symptoms so we decide case based okay okay um that that really makes sense because uh, i i think hrt does help uh especially in people in whom i mean if the person is able to tolerate that's again a big thing i mean for a person like me you know it for me i could not tolerate hrt so it really depends on your acceptance if you are able to accept i think that's the best choice to go for if you have a premature menopause so uh julie you were going through something as drastic during this period who was your biggest support so um family was my biggest support i mean it's always family and friends you know the people who are closest because honestly beyond them not too many people uh, know what has happened in your life right i mean if you are acting crazy and if you are irritated uh, your family knows you've gone through um, menopause you are going through menopause so i have had a very supportive family my sister my mom my husband everybody's uh, you know they've been supportive of the fact that you know i am going through this uh, so while we are on this you know um, i i do work right i'm i am working and uh, this is not something that uh, i would ever talk about at work i mean i'm not going to land up going and telling my uh, friends or uh, colleagues or you know my teammates that you know i'm feeling like this today because i'm going through menopause because Correct. we don't talk about these things right it's it's sure. but women go through it women who are working go through it 
so you just tend to figure out an alternative to deal with it but uh, yeah it's very important to have that support system uh, you know because you are undergoing so many changes uh, and normally women undergo this change like doctor mentioned you know in their 40s and that's the time either your kids are young like mine are young because i had them late but that's also a time when for most women kids are either in their teenage years so there's an empty nest there are aging parents so there's so much chaos in life in general and you're going through this so it just becomes very difficult to deal with too many uh, aspects in your life and uh, you know support system is very important uh, i could deal with it better because i had a support system around me and i think women need to talk or you know tell people around them that you know i am going through this and uh, you know please uh, understand that you know it's not a lot in my control when i'm a certain way so correct yeah um i think family support is very important true um so you said that uh, obviously the surgical menopause when you started researching and that's how you came up with living fearless and as i was reading through your insta post uh, insta posts actually so you have said a lot about how a woman should actually live with menopause so can you tell our audience a little bit about how to actually live a better life yeah so um and this is all from what i have experienced and i have managed to you know uh, do in the last uh, few months i think uh, getting like i mentioned you know getting that control around stress levels um, i have seen uh, and i have uh, you know when i get hot flash i do get them very rarely but i know exactly when i get them when i'm stressed i know those trigger points you know i know ki abhi ye aise hua hai to i am suddenly going to get very worked up and i'm going to get a flash so recognizing that flash is very important you know right when it's when you know that you know you you're getting a little hyper about something you have to consciously make that effort to sort of control stress and uh, you know take care of that uh, again like i mentioned you know uh, exercising i think that's that's taken care of almost 50% of how i feel my fatigue levels have come down in fact my fatigue levels have come down with exercising okay so it's it uh, incredible you know that i somehow yeah. moved to a phase where i feel more energetic with exercises and not exhausted correct and i really recommend that doing more than doing cardio or zumba like that i think all women should adopt doing strength training very strength very training. important they are resistance training strength training lifting weights Mm. very important because i have seen my pains you know whatever pains i have had when i've managed to strengthen those muscles like quadriceps or things like that i've seen a difference in my body so it really works i consciously um, cut down or reduced on sugar in the food that i have um i think it's worked i think it's helped to keep the weight gain in control and the most important thing is controlled uh, food portions you know uh, very important because i think what happens with most of us and most women is uh, as we age we start getting less active we are more inactive and uh, the quantity of food we consume remains the same and the metabolism is slowing so it's like the deadliest combination you know and you are going to put on weight so uh that whole uh, consciousness in life really really helps you know being conscious of everything that you do helps and it's not an effort you know i think after after a couple of days it just becomes second nature like every time you take food you consciously take slightly less a portion because i've seen most women you know uh, who reach out to me on my page tell me we are putting on weight and what do we do what do we do and i'm like this you know some extent of weight gain is going to happen i i'm not a dietitian i can't help you with that but these are minor things you know and just minor lifestyle changes like these um really help and i think having somebody to talk to um uh, is is a uh, is a real good uh, you know addition to dealing with it not dealing with it on your own like having a friend to talk to or a family to talk to um uh, really help so like i said you know very small changes but they go a long way in making you deal with uh the sort of uh, change that is happening yeah, the, the change yeah the transition that's happening the transition that's, that's happening that's that's something which is really important and also what i feel is uh, you need to push yourself to do things you know yes. you would not feel like doing it but you have to do it 
So yes. when we come into you have to do things. Endometriosis. Have the things you don't feel like doing because you're in pain throughout. <laughs> so, and uh, when you go to a doctor, as we were discussing before coming on this live, uh, people are advised hysterectomy as a cure for endometriosis. How true is that? That's the biggest myth associated with endometriosis. That hysterectomy. Get the hysterectomy done, and your problem will be sorted out. now the disease is outside the uterus i don't know how it is going to help women when they remove the uterus so endometriosis happens outside the uterus all of us know that and the disease which happens in the uterus is adenomyosis correct so i agree if you have adenomyosis and endometriosis and you have been advised hysterectomy it will work for you but along with that endometriosis excision should be done otherwise your endometriosis even after removing the uterus is going to trouble you the pelvic pain fatigue all the symptoms will remain the bowel symptoms and the urinary symptoms mm. but majority of the population majority of our patients come back to us and they say they have gone to several gynecologists and they have been told that get the hysterectomy done and your problem will be should sort it out or wait till the age of menopause true if your family is complete you suffer in pain and wait 10 more years if you don't want the surgery done so menopause will come and your endometriosis will go away now we feel really sad when patients are told like that so this is a disease which happens outside the uterus patients also have to understand i mean the doctors need to understand and counsel the patients accordingly being a, a disease in majority of women i would say majority of women because it also affects uh, like i have to be uh, why i said that is when the disease which is predominantly in women is less talked about absolutely we don't discuss about it if it is a disease of men everybody will be discussing about it there will be a more research more funding more solutions true that true that absolutely But yes now we are seeing that a lot of awareness is happening and a lot of movement is happening so it is going to help our patients more so endometriosis hysterectomy does not help please keep that in mind and if you are going for hysterectomy also please make sure that uh, endometriosis excision is also done wherever it is now even after endometriosis excision or after the natural age of menopause endometriosis can happen because this tissue is not the endometrium this is a similar tissue to endometrium which implants outside and it produces its own hormones so it's not true that you are deprived of hormones so this tissue will also die off and there won't be any growth so we are seeing many patients with postmenopausal endometriosis nowadays and that's a natural age of menopause and they have developed endometriosis or it was there maybe they became symptomatic after that but it can happen even after menopause absolutely so we want to emphasize again menopause does not cure endometriosis as it is commonly said and if your doctor says so just run from there the first thing just run off and find another doctor for yourself <laughs> so uh, so julie tell me uh, what has helped you besides the exercise part and mindfulness that you were talking about uh, any supplements maybe herbs teas vitamins what has helped you when it comes to menopause um so yeah like doctor when we mentioned calcium and uh, uh, vitamin d Uh, my bread and butter literally every day i i have to take them um what else that i have been taking is uh, when i i had knee pain i was also taking those glucosamine supplements um, they worked i'm not sure whether they were the ones that worked or the exercise worked but both of it together i've i've stopped taking them now hmm. and the pain hasn't come back but both of it together did uh, did help me and did do well uh i am also put on an hrt uh, that you uh, would notable on which is uh, normally recommended yeah so when i started taking it uh, this that is one very interesting thing and i don't know dr vimmi might uh, want to you know add to that that when i started taking tibolon i started exponentially gaining weight at one point in time and then uh, i stopped it for a while because i got very scared uh, why is that happening and then i realized that if i uh, adjust the dose so for me one alternate day works when i did that the uh, 
you know the um, the impact or you know the benefit i could really see that you know it's helping me and it's it's also suiting my body so i think finding the correct thing that suits everybody's body in terms of dose and which hrt it is also is very important uh, while we are on this topic so yeah um, that about and i do take omega 3 supplements mm-hmm. but yeah nothing beyond that i mean i think tibolon does a lot of uh, what it's probably yeah has to do with the so protection on the bones yeah. the safest safest drugs right with me tibolon yes yeah the newer ones <laughs> the tibolon works very well and it uh, protects the bone as well and as julie mentioned yes many of the patients report as weight gain as a side effect and dose adjustment is very very important so even for uh, estrogen supplements sometimes we give as alternate day therapy mm. as uh, you are taking tibolon so sometimes one dose work works for one patient one dose it may not work for other patient mm. like excision surgery we say one size does not fit all same applicable same is applicable for hrt so you may tolerate one kind of drug other may not tolerate like shilpa she had tried everything yes she right. could not even tolerate tibolol so she had the uh, side effects with all the medications yeah so i think it's more about it's more about the you know the migraine and the bloating if at all all these things suddenly come if all these things are there then taking hrt gets a little more problematic yes. you know so but hrt if possible i think it's the best choice yes it, it, it i mean honestly yeah, if you are really struggling then uh, it's it better works. to take that than continue true. struggling true true so we me uh, what can be done for artificial menopause which is caused due to drugs especially because in endometriosis mostly the medical management which is given you know does induce medical medically induced menopause so how what what can be done about it somebody has to come forward and ban the gnr channels absolutely <laughs> and it uses for endometriosis i should not say ban the drug because we use it for other indications also so for endometriosis it is used left and right so that should not happen we have patients who have already taken some 8 or 10 doses of gnr so you can imagine what bone loss she terrible. has undergone already terrible so gnr channels actually creates a state of menopause in the body it is a, a centrally acting hormone which uh, affects the ovaries and reduces the fsh and lh level and ultimately the ovaries don't work your symptoms may reduce but the disease keeps progressing so True. endometriosis does not go away it does not cure endometriosis be it any drug it can be oral contraceptive pills or dinogest or any progesterones but they are much safer than gnr analogs the side effect profile is very less but gnr analogs are not good patients have uh, entered permanent menopause patients report memory loss patients have severe osteoporosis bone fractures and ov- ovarian failures are very very common Absolutely. so these are the major side effects which patients have been reporting and gnr analogs one or two or three doses is still okay for some patients who are trying for pregnancy the ivf consultants prefer to give but patients are being given long therapies uh, without any benefit so uh, patient symptoms come down and they think that the drug is working but actually it is not working and it is doing more harm True. so gnr analogs create a stage of uh, pseudo menopause and causes a lot of side effects and a lot of unseen harm which is happening in the body So these and are silent changes. Yes, sorry, uh, a lot of them are irreversible changes, right? A lot of them are irreversible. Hmm. What happens is it causes a uh, uh, invisible changes. You can't realize, like cardiac changes, uh, uh, risk of heart attack increases. So uh, these things, patients does not realize that it is happening in the body. But if we hmm. do a study and then we can prove it. that becomes more scientific and it's very difficult for us to tell the patient if she has pain and the pain comes down with the injection why she'll not take it so it's it's a moral duty of the like our colleagues to tell our patients that this drug does not work for endometriosis endometriosis needs excision a proper excision followed by sometimes we do prescribe progesterone based therapy so, so uh, because first three or four periods can be more painful post excision so oral contraceptive pills and progesterone based therapies help and if a patient has uh, adenomyosis as well 
So mm-hmm. Mirena, we also prescribe for some of the patients. Okay. So here the patient awareness and doctor counseling is very, very important so that we can avoid misuse of certain drugs, which are more of pharma driven than patient benefit. Absolutely. I mean, and, and the worst thing is patients are not even told about the side effects of the medicines. These, I mean, the side effects that these medicines cause, which are like so terrible. Uh, these I, prescriptions and the uh, patient doesn't know what drug is given. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. I, I remember when they've come back. I, I remember when I was taking my buprid injection, I had asked the doctor, I being in this profession, I had asked the doctor for the uh, for the ca- uh, for the dabba, just the one in which you keep the injection, mm. and they bluntly bluntly refused. They're like, we can't give this. Oh. So, so the thing is, because there is an entire literature in that, right? You know, you can read through that literature. You know, so and and what I was saying is, Julie, a lot of times the bone pains that we are having may be the side effect of the luperide which we have taken. Yeah, you know? I mean, you know. Uh, Dr. Shilpa, you and me, we uh, we are consciously because we've seen all this. But there are so many of them who will not understand it. Even if they try to read the label, sometimes uh, you know it is difficult for a layman who's not been there. So it's it's something that they have to be educated about by their doctor saying that you know you, do, you don't have to take this. Like my arthritis lasted for like eight months with Lupride. After Lupride, it didn't go. I mean, I was dealing with that too. So. I mean, we don't know this, right? It's crazy. That's what. So it's been like a good discussion. So Julie, any parting words for our audience? Um, you no, know, I, you know, since I have this platform and, uh, you know, to any, anybody and uh, everybody, all the women uh, who are here watching, you know, it's a request that, you know, we talk about puberty, you know, uh, every mother educates her daughter about uh, the periods that she will go through and what will happen. And then at some point in time, we lose plot. We get conscious about talking anything related to menstruation or periods. And it's, uh, you know, it's treated as something that, you know, which is taboo. You don't have to speak about. But uh, it's a request to all the women here that, you know, please talk about it. You know, it is really important that you talk about it uh, to your friend, to your aunt, uh, to, uh, you know, uh, whoever else around, because I have seen a lot of women suffering mentally and emotionally because of this, and they don't know what to do. So uh, it is our responsibility to get that conversation going and to get as many women aware about, uh, you know, that if they're undergoing changes in their body at this age, It could likely be menopause, not necessarily, but it could likely be menopause. So let's not treat it as something which is, uh, you know, not to be spoken about or, you know, it's not that important because uh, even if there is a good deal of women who have no symptoms, there is a lot of women who struggle and they don't come out and talk about it because they think, you know, uh, it shouldn't be spoken about or things like that. So, uh, yeah, that is what, and if if you need help, uh, you know, do, do not continue to suffer. There are options that you can reach out to and, uh, you know, take care of. And I, I honestly, personally think all women post 35 have to consciously start taking care of themselves. Uh, themselves. Very, very important. As much as they take care of their family and kids and all of that. So Makes sense. Makes complete sense. And what I would really have to say is we need to talk about this so that our future generations get, you know, are not going through what we have been going through. Right. You know, so so that I mean, I, I think this has been like one of the sessions which I which we really wanted to do for a very long time because besides having physical symptoms, going through menopause alone is not easy. As much as the pain of endometriosis or menopause has caused, it has actually made us what we are. Yeah. So, and I think uh, it's it's awesome that we are able to help somebody at least. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so with me. It, it was a lovely session as always. And Julie, thank you so much for, thank you for having being, me. being on our show. And uh, thanks to all our audience who have been supporting us like all the time. Thank you so much and have been a lovely, lovely week ahead. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bye-bye. Julie. Thanks, Shilpa. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vimi.